Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of modeling, analysis and design of PB structure. I am Surajit Ghosh and in this session, I will cover an important topic. What are the different components of a pre-engineered steel building and which structural components we need to model for analysis and design? When we model any structure for detail analysis and design, we consider those elements which contribute to the structural stability, safety and performance. Just for an example, we never consider any partition wall, fall ceiling or architectural element in the structural model. Obviously we can, but these elements don't have any significant contribution to the stability of the structure. And if we model, that not only increase the modeling time, but also increase our effort to interpret the results. So, we avoid modeling any unnecessary components with negligible structural contribution and consider only the loads coming from these elements. There is one problem. Before ignoring any element, we need to evaluate its contribution and accordingly differentiate between structural and non-structural elements. Else, the analysis results will be affected. For example, do you know if we don't model a brick wall or consider the stiffness during analysis, that might increase the section size? External brick walls provide enough stiffness against lateral load and when a seismic or wind load is applied on the structure, these walls try to resist the lateral movement. So, we need to consider the stiffness of the brick wall. Latest IS-1893 or IS-800-2007 code suggest modeling the brick wall as a diagonal strut. Couple of years ago, I compared the behavior of few structures under lateral load with and without brick wall and noticed that when brick wall is modeled as a diagonal strut, column size and reinforcement percentage is reduced by considerable amount. Anyway, that is a different topic. If you are interested to know about this, let me know in the comments. There is another very important aspect which we need to keep in mind. Ease of modeling. There are few structural elements which are very tough to model, like the roof panels of any warehouse, which provide lateral stability, resist the torsional buckling of the purlins. But to model it properly, we need to generate a finite element mesh, Roof panels don't behave like a rigid diaphragm and to consider the outer plane deformation, it is better to model it using plate mesh. As this is time consuming, so normally we don't model the roof and apply the load coming from the seat directly on the purlin. During design, we can consider the stiffness contribution by assigning correct design parameter. I think it is clear now that before modeling any structure, it is very important to identify the structural components. Consider only those elements which are critical for the structural performance and stability like columns, rafter, girder or purlin and ignore any non-structural element which has little contribution compared to the effort required to model it. In any typical PEB structure, like a large warehouse or processing unit, there are various structural and architectural components. And it also varies depending on the structure type. Like in a warehouse, there is no crane. Among all these components, we need to model only those which have significant contribution on analysis and design results and which are easy to model. I will clarify this shortly. Let's start with the main supporting members, which we need to model. The main frame consists of column and rafter. Typically, a tapered section with different start and in depth is used. How this tapered profile is determined and how we can optimize it by reviewing the bending profile that I have already discussed in the steel optimization series. These members create the main structural cage carry and finally transfer all the loads to the foundation. Also, we need to model any load carrying column and beam like the structural members at the end panels or any intermediate column 
which supports a platform or load bearing element. Along with this, we need to model the purlin which supports the roof panel. Either a channel, Z section or even a tube section is used for this. And these are very important structural members as it not only carry and transfer the roof panel load but also provide adequate lateral stiffness to the rafter member. During design parameter assignment, I will discuss how the effective length for compression and lateral torsional buckling depends on the placement of the purlin members. Purlins are also used in the side walls to support the wall cladding. These side purlins are also known as the gut and we need to model this. To keep the purlin or gut in the place and to resist any web or flange buckling, all these members are connected using a sag rod. It is not clear in this picture. Looks something like this. And typically a solid 10 or 12 mm rod with threaded ends are used in a zigzag pattern. These sag rods are very important for the stability and design of the entire structure. Several sag rods are used in each panel. So the total number is quite large. And for simplicity, we don't model these elements. Rather, we consider its effect on the purlin using correct design parameter. Modeling the sag rod will increase the modeling time with small change in the results. If a heavy section is used, like a tube section, then it is better to consider this in the model. By the way, we also don't model any roof or wall panel as discussed earlier. Generating a finite element mesh is a time consuming job. It is better to ignore the stiffness to save modeling and analysis time and apply the loads directly as a floor load. Next, the cross bracing members, which are very important for the lateral stability of the structure. Bracing members don't carry any gravity load, but when a lateral load is applied on the structure, like a wind or seismic load, it contributes by forming a load transfer path. Do you know braced panels are more stable to a lateral load? compared to the unbraced panel? That does not mean we assign brace to all the panels. That is an uneconomic design. How the bracing members reduce the section size by providing lateral stiffness? And which panels contribute more? That I will cover in the latter part of this series. If there is any crane, we can model the crane girder and the corbel. Corbel is the supporting bracket on which the crane gutters are placed. When a crane moves, a vertical load is applied on the corbel along with a horizontal load and axial thrust. And finally, these loads are transferred to the column. As the crane load is eccentric in nature, it is very important to consider this for the design of the column. And we need to strengthen the joint by providing additional stiffener and doppler plate. We can model this entire crane arrangement and apply a moving load to simulate the crane load. Else, we can manually calculate the maximum crane load and apply the load directly on the corbel without modeling the crane gutter. This process is easy, less time and effort are required, hence widely used in the industry. Still, in this series, I will discuss how we can model the entire crane gutter easily instead using a custom macro. Till now, I have covered all the important structural elements of the superstructure. In any large structure, there are several other components like the sidewall, stair or ramp, which you need to model. This is case specific and as an engineer, we need to decide whether we are going to model this or not. For foundation, I normally suggest not to model the concrete pedestal along with the superstructure. Obviously, it depends on the height. We can assign fixity at the base plate level and during foundation design, we can consider the pedestal for analysis and design. Also, for a matte foundation, I recommend not to model the finite element mesh along with the superstructure. Plate mesh increase both the modeling and analysis time and if we redesign the structure to select optimum member size, in each iteration, additional time is required to analyze the plate mesh, 
which is not required during member design phase. We can always export the support reaction to state foundation, model the plate mesh there, and design it as a mat foundation. This small trick can save a lot of time during analysis and member selection. That's all. I think I have covered all the structural components of a pre-engineered building. If I forgot to mention something, let me know in the comments. I'll cover that in the next video. See you soon in the next part, where I'll start modeling a PEB structure using the analytical modeler.